Welcome to the Clutch Kitten Gaming Podcast, where I play an indie game for five hours and let you know whether or not it's worth your time and money. Hello and welcome everyone. This is James, also known as Clutch Kitten, and I am so, so glad that you're here for episode 43 of the show. Thanks to all of you for bearing with me as I took last week off. I was planning to do a show, but then real life just kind of got in the way. As much as I was trying to avoid taking weeks off, it was necessary, so I appreciate you coming back to the show. One exciting thing to mention is that I got some amazing questions from friends on Instagram while I was away. My plan is to get to all of them over the next few episodes, but let's tackle two of them right now. Our first question comes to us from Harry Tasiakos, who asks, On a scale of 1 to 10, how excited are you for the next Legend of Zelda? So my assumption is that Harry is asking about Breath of the Wild 2 and not Link's Awakening Remake, but I'll answer the question for both just in case. Also, for those of you who are not already aware, Breath of the Wild 2 was one of the games teased at E3 the other week. Okay, so in terms of Breath of the Wild 2, I'm currently at an 8 for my excitement. Now, do keep in mind that I still haven't beaten the first Breath of the Wild yet, and I haven't played it for a few months, so I think my hype on the game isn't as high as it is when I'm actually playing. That being said, I'm still stoked for the sequel. Breath of the Wild really took the open world genre to a new place, and I think everyone should be excited for the sequel, whether or not they're Zelda fans. It's going to be awesome seeing what Nintendo iterates on this time around, and how it will affect the open world games of the future. In terms of Link's Awakening, I'm at a 7.5 of excitement. I personally have never played the original, but I love how the remake looks, and it seems like an awesome time to jump in and experience at least a reimagining of that game. I've been talking with a bunch of people recently about all the new games on the horizon, and it's absolutely incredible how many amazing games will be releasing in the next year. Today's second question comes to us from Salty Dags, who asks, Would you rather have endless free time to play games, but can only buy two games a year, or would you, be, would you rather be able to buy any game whenever with very little time to play? This question really comes down to the time or money trade-off. My initial answer is most definitely having endless free time to play games. The great trade-off of adulting is that you typically have more disposable income, but way less time. I feel that a whole lot right now especially. We just moved and got a new TV, but I barely have gotten to play anything on it. There's just no time at the moment. That being said, the idea that I would be limited only to two games would be kind of brutal. Even if those games were huge, like Breath of the Wild and League of Legends, there would have to come a point where I'd want something new. Plus, a lot of indie games I play are not very time intensive. So I guess the answer is that I don't have an answer because both options are both good and bad. Just like both of these guys, if you guys have a question as well that you want me to answer on the show, all you have to do is shoot me an email to clutchkittengaming at gmail.com or DM me on Instagram at clutchkittengaming. This is usually the part of the show where I talk about news, but I think I have news paralysis. Is that a thing? There has been so much news off the back of E3, and although I want to jump into things, We'll be here for a three hour long episode if I do, so instead, let's just jump right into this week's game. Today we're going to be talking about Gato Roboto. I figured that since Cat Quest proved to be pretty, uh, well, lame, I needed to find another cat game that lived up to the Clutch Kitten Gaming Slayer endorsement. Let's find out if Gato Roboto is that game. Gato Roboto is a minimalistic 2D action platformer that is heavily inspired by Metroid. Some people are even calling this game a Metroid Lite. It was released on May 30th of 2019 and was developed by Doinksoft. 
What's weird is that Doinksoft is a pretty unknown developer. Gato Roboto is their first game as a studio, and it's really hard to learn much about who made the game and where they live. This game is out for both PC and Switch, and it takes anywhere from about 4 to 5.5 hours to beat. It currently costs just shy of $8, and in terms of controls, GamePad seems to be the best way to go. I'm sure you could make the mouse and keyboard work fine, but if you decide to play this on PC, I would definitely recommend hooking up a controller. Let's take a moment now to talk about the narrative. Oh no, we're in for it. Our systems are down, and we're headed straight for that unknown planet. The best we can do is hope its inhabitants are friendly, and that we can get the hell home. Crap. Crashing was bad enough, but now I can't move my legs. How are we going to find help now? Kiki, you're our only hope. I know you're just an adorable kitty, but you have the ability. Nay, you have the honor of finding help for us so we can get off this godforsaken planet. The premise of Gato Roboto is pretty simple. Explore the planet and see what you can find. You play as little Kiki, but you're accompanied via radio by your confidant and captain. Since you're a cat and can only meow, obviously in the cutest of ways, the majority of the story is developed through your partner's dialogue and the audio logs you find left behind. There isn't a whole lot of detail that I can get into without spoiling the story, so let's just talk about the narrative as a whole. Overall, the story was adequate. The pacing was quick enough to keep me interested, but the plot itself wasn't particularly crazy or innovative. There were a couple of small twists, but what you imagine the story to be is probably pretty close to what the story actually is. One aspect I did find to be charming was the writing. By the end of the game, I felt a connection with the captain. He was my partner and companion, despite the fact that I was actually slaughtering hundreds of alien creatures. He still saw me, his pet, as a sweet and brave and kind friend. Some of the writing was also very humorous, especially when it comes to the bosses. All in all, this isn't a game you come to for the story, but it did achieve slightly more than the bare minimum for an action platformer. The story provided a loose framework for what you needed to do, and it added in a bit of flair. Now that we have some narrative context to the game, let's talk about some gameplay. Since most of you probably have a good idea of what a Metroid-inspired game looks like, or at least an action platformer, I'm not going to linger long on the basic loop of the game. You platform and fight your way through an area to inevitably fight a boss in the end. You generally gain one new ability along the way, which gives you access to a previously inaccessible place. You then go to that new area and repeat the process. That framework is nothing new. There's a reason it has been used so many times. It's a fun design that provides a nice sense of satisfaction. That being said, it still is important to add some flair and creativity to the base concept, so let's talk about what Gato Roboto does to add to that formula. Something I haven't explained super well yet is that Kiki, the cat you play, isn't a robot. You're a living, breathing kitty, however, you get to control a robot for a large portion of the game. Basically, you as the kitty are like Zero Suit Samus. So how does that factor into the gameplay? When you're in your mech suit, you're powerful. You have a lot of health, you're mobile, and you have firepower. But when you're skittering around outside of the suit, you're incredibly vulnerable, but you're small and can climb walls. This leads to some pretty fun level designs. When you're in the suit, the game encourages you to be aggressive and offensive, but when you get into those sections that only Kiki can reach, it's almost like you're on a stealth mission. You have to sneak around and avoid enemies because you literally will die if you get hit once. What was especially clever about this mechanic was that it kept the game fresh. It made it so that you have to vary your playstyle on occasion, and it also allowed for some other cute vehicles like the fearsome cat sub and kitty turret. Apart from being in and out of the suit, the game has all the basics that you've come to expect from these types of games. There are missiles, 
basic attacks, a double jump, and you even unlock a dash, which ends up being incredibly useful later on. There are also collectible secrets you can find which come in the form of cartridges. This game is monochromatic, so every time you unlock a new cartridge, it unlocks a new color palette. My personal favorite was called Coffee Stain, but if that's not for you, I'm sure there's one to fit your taste. In terms of boss fights, I think Doinksoft did a great job. Each fight felt unique, and they were difficult, yet doable. Most of the bosses had humorous personas, and they were satisfying to beat. Before we wrap up the gameplay section, I want to touch on one small complaint I had about the game. Although the save points felt well paced, I really disliked how slow the death animations would take. I'm not sure if there is any technical explanation as to why it would take multiple seconds to die and respawn, but that's one of my pet peeves in games, specifically when it comes to platformers. Sometimes you just make a dumb mistake and want to get right back to the action, but when it takes multiple seconds to die and respawn back at the save point, it really hurts the flow of the experience. Maybe that won't be an annoyance to you, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Overall, the gameplay was solid. Like with the narrative, it felt like it went just barely above and beyond what's expected from this type of game. It was fun to play, but it's also not an experience that will blow your mind. Now that we've made it through the narrative and gameplay, how was the art and sound design? On the art side, this game is very cute. It has a very minimalistic, pixel art design, which worked well for the game. The ability to swap color palettes was also a neat touch to create some fun variants visually. You've probably noticed a pattern by now, but the art also has that slightly above average feel. It's good, but also don't expect Celeste or Katana Zero levels of good. On the sound design side, the sound effects were great. They fit well with the game, and the Charlie Brown teacher style of voices were also apt given the design direction that was taken. In terms of the soundtrack, this was actually what I was the least impressed by in Gato Roboto. It's not that it was bad per se, it was just very forgettable in my opinion. It was a noise that was there, and it didn't necessarily hurt the experience, but I don't think it added anything worthwhile to my time either. Now that we've made it through the narrative, gameplay, art and sound design, let's summarize with some positives and negatives. First off on the positive side, the narrative was cute. It was honoring to the feline race, and it was well scripted. Second, the action was paced well, and it was fun. Also, the way that playing Kiki versus playing as Robot Kiki pushed you to vary your playstyle was really beneficial to the experience. Third, the pixel art was lovely to look at, and I loved the way that the collectibles had an effect on the visual style of the game. First off on the negative side, I really wish the time from death to respawn was quicker. After playing games like The Messenger and Celeste, where you respawn almost instantaneously, the deaths in Gato felt like wading through a pool of molasses. Second, the soundtrack could use a facelift. I'm happy that it didn't actively detract from the title, but a game's score can add so much to a player's experience. This aspect really was a missed opportunity. We made it now to the final boss. This is the part of the podcast where I let you know whether you should slay the game and buy it, flee the game and avoid it, or farm up and wait for a sale. I'm happy to say that my verdict is to slay this game. If I was to grade Gato Roboto on a school grading scale, I would probably give it a B+. It's not a game that's going on my top 10 of all time, but Doinksoft put together a solid and fun experience that is still worth your time and money. I'm also happy to say that it didn't feel like Doinksoft included a cat for the sake of marketing and impulse buys. It added a cute element to the game, but it didn't sacrifice good gameplay for over-the-top cat puns. As always, thank you all so much for taking the time to listen in. Don't forget to send me your thoughts and questions, and if you enjoy the show and keep listening, 
make sure you jump over to iTunes to give it 5 stars. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and I'll see you in game. 